so much for introduction. It, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk at this famous regular meeting. Um, so the talk would be real eigenvalues of complete hypergraphs. Um, it's a relatively new area, but it turns out that it has connections to really old branches of math, specifically symmetric functions and um, uh, inequalities about symmetric functions. So I'll give a brief outline. I'm certainly gonna talk less than Rob Morris, um, but um, I hope to give some information as well. So um, first, just a few words for spectra of hypergraphs. It is not uh, an introduction intended to leave strong traces. I mean, you need to read a lot more, but just to have some idea what it is about, and then specify a particular kind of eigenvalues for hypergraphs. And further, I'm going to focus on the smallest eigenvalue of complete hypergraphs. So, and that this particular topic um, has connection to minimizing elementary symmetric functions. This is the classical topic that I was talking. Um, so give equivalent theorem um, for the minimum certain, certain conditional minima of elementary symmetric functions and um, give some details of the proof. So let me start with uh, the introduction. Not everything um, is um, well defined in the sphere, in the area of spectra of hypergraphs. They're competing approaches. Um, none of them is really admitted by everyone else, but the one that is particularly um, strong and seems to have connections with um, other areas of math is approach based on hyper matrices or as they're known predominantly as tensors, although my own preference is for hyper matrix. Um, for symmetric hyper matrices, the concept of eigenvalues was first systematically introduced by Li Chun Chi in 2005, a very influential paper. Um, and a bit later, um, to some extent independently, uh, but to the same effect, uh, Cooper and Duttel adapted the concept of eigenvalues to uniform hypergraphs. It should be understood that this basically um, is our definitions um, within algebraic geometry. That's the, the ground. So hyper determinants and uh, whatnot, so solutions of um, huge polynomial equations. Uh, since then, there is a really rich literature. Uh, people are working very intensively. So I would like to convince you that there is some form background in the um, spectra of eigenvalues of hypergraphs. So let me remind you first um, the definition of eigenvalues of two graphs. So um, if you somehow cut short, uh, don't use the adjacency matrix, you can come up with a system of equations where you have um, one unknown for each vertex of the graph and one common unknown lambda. So you can write down the system of eigen equations um, in that simple form, mostly combinatorial, and then try to extend this for k graphs, three, four, etc. So here I'm giving um, the form of the equations, it's again a system of n equations if the graph is, is of order n, uh, but they are non-linear now. So they're non-linear um, and don't seem very easy to swallow. Um, so 
so as before, we're going to go call um, a number lambda which satisfies those equations um, for some non-zero complex vector. Complex, this should be noted, um, is called an eigenvalue of the graph if, and the corresponding vector is an eigenvector. So I want to point out immediately one of the probably thousand deficiencies of this approach. It's very powerful, but just uh, we have to forget about a lot of baggage from Grinnell algebra. So first of all, um, even for simple K graphs, like complete ones, T graphs, complete T graphs, we have complex eigenvalues and complex eigenvectors, something that we didn't, know, didn't have for ordinary graphs. So the zero is always an eigenvalue, which is not true for the, for the two graphs. And it is of high multiplicity. What I find this is the worst news about um, eigenvalues of K graphs that there are extremely many of them. This is due to the fact that when uh, you ap apply the, appro the general approach of um, algebraic geometry to this system of um, nonlinear equations, you end up with um, a lot of spurious. Um, extra roots, which may be, which probably can be weeded out, but um, formally that's the amount. It's just for three graphs, it's exponentially growing in, in the order of the graph. So, and you can imagine that um, computing the eigenvalues probably is not an easy task. You can do this sometimes easily, but usually to com compute the whole lot of eigenvalues of a given graph is difficult. So now, as I said, there are um, many um, complex eigenvalues. So if you kind of try to prune them out and um, leave only with eigenvalues which are have real eigenvectors, this gives rise of the H eigenvalues, which are introduced by G. Um, and so not only they have real eigenvectors, but they're real quantities themselves. So which kind of keeps us closer to the uh, spectrum of graphs, of two graphs. So it is true that uh, the H eigenvalues can be easier to compute and it seems to be closer to the structure of hypergraphs like we expect, like we know this is the case um, with two, two graphs. Now, one thing which should be noted, um, we, take, we immediately can arrange the H eigenvalues um, in the order of their magnitude. So we can talk about the largest, the second largest and the smallest H eigenvalues of a K graph, which sound, sounds reassuring because we have heard uh, now and then this, um, this particular terms used in connection to two graphs and we believe that they, they give very important information about the, the two graphs. So um, from now on, I'm focusing on complete K graphs. So, um, Cooper and Guto did really an amazing job uh, in the computing uh, eigenvalues of various graphs. In particular, they advocate for the study of um, eigenvalues of complete graph, and they completely resolved the problem for three graphs. Not an easy job, um, so they have to be given credit. Now, what about four or four? So. Almost nothing is known. So partial results are known. Uh, like for instance, we know that the largest H eigenvalue is just the spectral radius um, of a K graph, but the smallest eigenvalue is not known. So, and I'm gonna focus now from now on the, on the smallest H eigenvalue. So, and by 
soon I'll connect it to something very understandable. Um, so you, you may safely forget about those definitions. Uh, so let's introduce this notation K sub n, uh, K for the complete K graph and lambda mean of this graph is the smallest H eigenvalue. So our problem in this talk would be to describe a possible approach to finding the lambda mean of the complete K graph for K greater than or equal to four. So, and I, I will further reduce um, the goal to determine just the order of magnitude. So as a function of K and N. So maybe it is, um, I should have written here uh, for comparison, the largest H eigenvalue, which as I said, is the spectral radius of, um, um, of all K graphs has, has received a lot of attention and it is much better understood than uh, anything else uh, for regular graphs in particular for um, the complete graphs, it is pretty well known. Not pretty well, known, it's exactly known. So it is of the order of magnitude is n to k minus one. So the spectral radius or the largest H eigenvalue of complete three graphs is n choose two more specifically. And minus one choose two, sorry. And minus one choose two. Um, and um, we would like to know what is actually, what power of n we have to use for lambda mean. So now I was able to, to answer this question for even k and odd k, which are three mod four um, for the other remaining case, k odd k one mod four, um, can just give a bump because everything um, can be seen there. So elementary symmetric functions. So I'll change gear here. I'll just introduce a few definitions and notation. Um, for any vector, not necessarily non-negative, real, but in fact, one can think even of complex vectors, the um, Kate elementary symmetric function of the variables x1 to xn is denoted by s sub k of x. So I, I use the bold notation for vectors um, and the uh, explicit entries because depending on the context, we may use one or the other. Now, when you look at the eigen equations of the complete graph for even k, it turns out that the finding the minimum H eigenvalue is the same thing as minimizing the k symmetric function of the variables X1 to Xn under the restriction their k power. So k is even, remember, so this become positive, um, sum of positive numbers is equal to one. So, the, this reminds the Rayleigh principle in linear algebra, so, but only for even k. So certain algebraically defined quantities, eigenvalues, which are usually introduced algebraically, that can be uh, obtained as well as variational, as solutions of variational problems. So you have a constraint um, minimization or maximization problem and um, you can get, so this is preserved, which is actually pretty good. So that's where the connection between eigenvalues and um, uh, symmetric function functions is uh, rooted. So, and I need also notation for the LP norm of, uh, of a vector. So that's the notation. And, this minimum that you see here in expanded form can be neatly written down um, as a minimum of the symmetric function over the, the sphere, the unisphere in LK. So now <sighs> 
there is a huge literature on, on symmetric functions. Really um, mind boggling, it um, goes um, deep in algebra and um, combinatoric. So, except that um, not everything is present there that you might want. Like for instance, this minimum seems to not be covered. So let me remind the Maclaurin inequality, which started the whole thing. And it is actually a sequence of inequalities and I, I dropped most of them. So I'm just comparing the K, uh, the, the maximum of the, I'm comparing the, K symmetric function of non-negative numbers with their average should be raised to power K. So there is a, such an equality and it is equality if and only if X is, all the X's are equal. Now, if we state um, as an extremal result, uh, this by properly scaling those X's, you may convert the Maclaurin inequality in such form um, as a, maximum over the sphere in L1, it's equal to certain fixed number. Um, but there, if you consider the sphere, not necessarily only non-negative numbers, uh, then there are a few more values which calls, may, which force equality unlike um, the original theorem of Maclaurin. So what about, that was a maximum Problem about the maximum, this one. So what about changing to minimum? I really browsed a lot, uh, Googled um, deep and wide, didn't, didn't find anything which may help in this direction. So here is the problem stated clearly. So take any P, which makes probably very little difference, um, which P you take, but um, it did make for me because you'll see there is this, I, I cannot solve the case greater than or equal to one, just greater than or equal to two. So minimize the k symmetric function over the unit sphere in LP. So it's not difficult to figure out, to, to see that this minimum is negative. It's always, you can choose simply an axis which make this negative, so you should, Look among negative values of the k, the k uh, symmetric function. So, so first of all, let's convince ourselves that this makes sense because sometimes we can write things that don't make sense. So, uh, the LP sphere unit sphere is compact space, and um, the k symmetric function is continuous in X. So this minimum exists and the problem makes sense. So, um, and someone already probably came up with the solution for odd K because the K elementary symmetric function is an odd function. Um, it just mirrors the maximum in the Maclaurin inequality with um, Opposite sign, so you immediately can answer this question. Nothing else can be done there. So that's why the, yes, the symmetric functions do not help in the odd k of the original problem about the smallest h eigenvalue. But there is a way to handle this situation, so you'll see. So as I said, the, solving this problem makes sense for any, uh, even k, um, it makes sense also for odd k, but trivial answer. Um, and it helps to find the minimum h eigenvalue for the even k. So uh, I did find something pretty close. Um, and in fact, that it's created to the, I felt somehow uh, that belong to a set of more than one uh, person. So when I saw that um, some luminaries in the computer science um, were interested um, a few years ago, namely Gopalan, Mecca, Reingold, Perizan, and Vathan, um, they were interested in 
the elementary symmetric function for a real x, not necessarily non-negative. So there is a later paper by Yehudeov and Gopolan. Um, so their interest though was not in the minimum. They wanted to see how, if you have limited two consecutive, you have bounds on two consecutive, on the moduli of the two consecutive uh, elementary symmetric function, and then can you bound any subsequent elementary symmetric function? Very interesting results for anyone. Um, and so I had to face this on, uh, from scratch. And here is the theorem, which I straightly uh, put here. So the main theorem, uh, that's how I'm gonna refer to the end of uh, this talk to this theorem. So what does it say? So if you take for some positive even K, it's true also for K two, but uh, maybe makes more impression for K above four. So, so four or above. So it determines what is the order of magnitude which, uh, for every P. It's a little bit um, difficult to read because of the three parameters N, K, and P. Um, if it is helpful, you can fix this to be two, then you have K over two, um, K over, yes, K over two, sorry. Um, one thing that you have to realize that that's the same order on both sides, except that the C1 and C2 are different, so. Now, I hurry up here to um, straightforwardly deduce um, the result that we were originally interested in. Now, if you plug P equal to K, as it was determined earlier, so this becomes one, one. So what you see here um, for every, even K greater or equal than four, there exists uh, two constants such that um, the minimum H eigenvalue of the complete graph is bounded. It has order approximately n to k over two minus one. So this is what we can get di directly from here. So as long as we have a proof of the main theorem. Now, somehow differently, um, the case odd k using the equations, I'm going to say a few words about that, can be reduced to the even k, and we can get a bound that um, the lambda mean cannot be very small. I mean, in the sense it cannot be the order of magnitude is n to k minus one over two. So what does that mean? Say for instance, it predicts that actually um, it shouldn't predict, it confirms that the order of magnitude of the minimum H eigenvalue of the complete three graph is in. The spectral radius is n squared, but the minimum eigenvalue is of order in. So the, for five, for K five, it would be two. Now that's a bound. It just says it cannot be very small, but um, for numbers which are comparable to three mod four, um, I can show a simple uh, example which shows that this um, the same bound holds from above. So um, I'm pretty much sure that. This is also true for K1 mod four. Um, so let, let's focus on this theorem because that's what we are facing now. So we have to prove two bounds, an upper and a lower bound on the, um, K symmetric function. Um, this is done in two separate stages. So first we're gonna prove the 
lower bound and then the upper bound with different approaches. So we need, um, like, uh, it's like any external problem, at least in combinatorics, you can prove that the quantity is uh, smaller than something that you have to give an example of construction that shows that this is precise. So um, proof of the lower bound. And there is a parameter P there. I mean, it shows what's the restriction, but um, it, one easily can obtain the general case for P from P equal to two. So that's why I'm uh, formulating a theorem A here, which um, um, reduces P to two and claims that the minimum uh, value of the k symmetric function is a constant. I mean, greater than certain constant, you're not drop. And that fits um, with our no knowledge about, um, about the minimum eigenvalue of complete two graphs. It's negative one. So it's a constant. So it turns out it's a constant in further uh, for SK um, for even K bigger than two. So um, first, as I said, we can confine ourselves to axes which make this quantity negative because you always can make this negative and we're looking for the minimum. Um, so we can think, we only want to consider such axis which um, makes this negative. And this lemma says that if you have a real vector, such that the sum of its entries is greater than the square root of the uh, squares, the sum of the squares, the L2 norm uh, times a quantity, then this turns out to be positive. You just cannot stop it. So, which means that in the future, we can forget about such cases. We can assume that this is less than or equal. So um, that means if we assume that X minimizes the K symmetric function, we, we can make this assumption. So it's not too big um, and it is greater than zero. Why it is greater than zero, we can assume because um, for even K S K is an um, even function. That means it attains the same value at X and negative X. So we can always force this to be non-negative. And then at the same time by the lemma, we can force to be less than or equal to. So another ingredient, if nothing, you don't remember anything of this talk, maybe you have to remember this lemma. They formulated it in a way, uh, Gopalan and uh, the five other people that you can easily Google that. Um, so here is the lemma understandable from anyone. So if X is a real vector and the L1 norm of the axis is not too big and the L2 norm of the axis is not too big, bounded by mu and mu squared, then you can claim that any um, K symmetric function um, is not too big in modules. So that's, this modules actually kills the direct application of the lemma to um, our goal. So we have to combine it to what you said, what, what you saw before. And so eventually when you combine the two lemmas, you just get the proof of the theorem because you have here a limitation on the, with, from that lemma on the modules and the other uh, gives you the sign. So um, the, okay, let me put it. So in addition to everything, this directly um, shows what C1, the C1 constant is on the left. So you have to have it. So you can, it's an explicit constant. So on the right, we won't have such luxury. So now, just the power mean inequality helps to extend this result from two to P. Uh, just the power mean inequality based on Jensen's inequality, very directly, nothing special. So we've got the left, the lower bound. 
Um, so, so we need to prove the upper bound. That's based on constructions. Again, some cases, mod four um, work better than others. Like for instance, for k equal to two mod four, um, you just take a vector Well, I mean, consisting of plus and minus one half of the vertices have plus one half of the vertices have minus one. Sorry, vertices is not uh, appropriate here. Just half of the values are negative one, half are positive one. And by using simple estimations, calculations, you can come up with um, finding an explicit constant. So for, uh, for SK, so this with that choice, very indicative, by the way, half of the vertices are negative one, the other half are positive one. Um, you get explicit constants here, bounds, which shows that the, the skate symmetric function cannot be very big. So, and exactly of the type of, um, exactly of the, uh, you get exactly the desired exponent. So this totally breaks um, for k equal zero mod four. What you're getting here is a positive number, which doesn't serve us uh, well. So I mean, when you, when you do the calculation, uh, you're getting a positive number, so it doesn't work well here. Um, nevertheless, we need to trace this case. Um, and um, here is here is an awkward statement uh, for every even k greater or equal than four, there exists a constant, and also n zero, um, such that if n is greater than n node, um, we can find a vector which satisfies this inequality, which proves the upper bound. So you can. See that, um, and uh, actually, the, most of my efforts went into proving this case. So the lower bound was not that difficult. Um, so I'm going to introduce a recursive sequence of monic polynomials um, defined by this formula. So it looks pretty simple, but it turns out that the coefficients of the polynomials grow very fast, pretty much like um, um, k factorial, although it's not obvious from the first several cases. So first of all, note that the degree of p sub k is precisely k. Um, and the first several terms of this sequence, just to give you some idea what we're getting, um, are listed here, very simple one. Um, and they become more and more complicated. As I said, it goes like k factorial. Um, don't remember which coefficient goes fastest. First of all, you can see that these are effectively polynomials of in x squared, but not for odd k, where you have x times a polynomial a squared. Um, I'm, I'm gonna focus on just very few things, which, is, which are not completely obvious, particularly the first one, it needs a proof by induction, it is a simple proof though. So the largest root of PK increases with K. So if we return here to that case, you see that um, some, some things are obvious like uh, P, sorry, um, like P2, P6, um, they are, they have negative coefficient and this negative uh, free term. So th this remains true by induction for every K equal to two mod four. So, um, but the statement here doesn't make any assumptions about K. So it says the largest root increases with K. Now, um, because the largest root of the 
P2 is one, uh, you can say the largest root of PK is positive. And as a corollary, you can show that for every K, there is a positive number mu K such that the polynomial is negative. So this is what we need. So as I said, the corollary is obvious if um, K is equal to two mod four because at the zero, the polynomial is negative. So therefore it has value mu K for which it is negative, which positive value. Um, so once you have the first lemma and know what you're looking for, it's not difficult to prove the rest. So, and we fix an even integer k, which plays the same role as before, um, set mu equal to mu k, and just remind that mu is positive and pk of mu is negative. And now we're constructing our vector for sufficiently large even number. So um, it has almost the structure of the vector, the simple vector plus minus one, except that we're taking a more complicated um, expression, which has been tailored precisely to give what I'm gonna state immediately, um, was chosen to give these simple things. The first thing, the sum of the xn's is mu, and the sum of the squares is one. So if you devise, if you try to find such a vector with simple structure, you probably are gonna end with something like that. So one thing that you have to note is that um, this vector has a very uh, small sum of the pip, the absolute values of the p power, p power. So particularly for three, five, it's a very small quantity because the, there is an um, alternation of the sign, they alternate plus minus, um, basically this one over n is the, determines the, the order of the entry. So that because n is assumed large, mu is fixed. Um, this doesn't affect essentially. So these are, uh, how to say, plus minus one scaled and slightly perturbed. So now you, using the classical inequalities, identities rather of Girard Newton, one can show that for every R from one to K, S R is equal to the value of the polynomial at mu divided by R factorial plus a quantity that tends to zero with n. So this is basically, um, basically what you can say is that every of the R um, of the first K symmetric functions of X are essentially determined by the sum of the axis and the sum of the squares of the axis. So the sum of the cubes, et cetera, doesn't really matter because it just goes there. Um, and if you take directly R, R equal to K, um, so this, this is proved by induction on R um, and you stop at K um, and Remember that this quantity is negative. It's a fixed negative number independent on it. That's what I mean by fixed. So that's how we have ch chosen it. And it turns out that this whole thing for R2 is, um, sorry, for uh, P2 and, and K is negative. So we basically, this vector turned out to give a negative quantity for SK and P2. And now making use of this equality, we can see that um, the thing remains valid for every, this equality remains valid for every P. And uh, this basically completes the proof of the main theorem. Now there are corollaries, but the main theorem is 
essentially outlined. So now to bound, in which of course, uh, due to the corollaries that I listed immediately after the, theorem, the main theorem, solves the problem for the minimum H eigenvalue of K of the complete K graphs for K even. Um, now, just uh, a trick with the eigen equations um, helps us to, to come up with this inequality that for odd values of K, um, they're greater than or equal than roughly N times the minimum H eigenvalue of the complete graph uh, uniformity one less, so two R. So, so um, sorry. Um, and which we already know quite a lot about. So we can use that. And um, we make use of the lower bound. So there is this positive C such that the minimum eigenvalue of the two, the two R plus one graph uh, is at least negative C n to the R. Um, unfortunately, I cannot back up for any odd R. There is finer vectors are probably necessary for uh, K, K equal to one mod four, but for K equal three mod four, um, this same vector alternating negative ones and ones um, can do the job. Um, so we can see an eigenvector which shows that lambda is not, not too big, it's smaller than the desired quantity. Um, so the conclusion is we determine what is the uh, order of magnitude of lambda mean uh, for this particular case. Uh, the case k equal one mod four remains, of course. Uh, so there are numerous open problems. First of all, those inequalities are first step just uh, focusing on the right order of magnitude. So and here are two remaining problems. Um, there are gaps. Maybe I'll say a few words, as you probably noticed um, in the constraint in the restriction um, over which is used to maximize, to minimize the K symmetric function. I use the LP norm starting from P equal to two. And it is pretty different from what happens between one and two. This is true even for uh, for two graphs, I don't know what would be the minimum um, between P1 and two uh, for the quadratic function, for instance. Of, uh, sorry, the um, quadratic form of the of the complete graph. So it's a um, it's not a difficult problem, probably, but I couldn't find a fast solution. Even don't have an intuition about that. So. Uh, again, that's a separate analytical problem. It doesn't uh, correspond to anything because the lambdas require just P to decay. And for that, we already have a solution. Um, so still there is much work to be done to find the uh, lambda mean precisely. Uh, and with that, I think then, I'm done, so maybe a little bit too fast, but uh, if you have questions, I'm ready to answer.